哋一齊衝出香港，了解一下唔同鄰近地區嘅一啲文化啦。喺佢哋嘅經驗入面，有咩可以借鏡一下呢？點接住落嚟嘅環節，我哋好難得邀請到嚟自九個亞洲地區嘅青年氣候組織代表一齊嚟互相交流。咁我哋包括咧由中國嘅代表啦、日本、印尼、馬來西亞、菲律賓、新加坡。韓國同埋台灣當然唔少得我哋香港嘅代表啦。咁大家呢，我相信可以咧多一重思考，睇下喺鄰近地區有乜嘢綠色減碳、綠色復甦嘅經驗，可以互相交流，彼此認識一下、學習一下。咁我哋香港代表、香港青年氣候行動創會成員鍾心如 a l e t a l i 就會帶領我哋同其餘八位代表討論地區氣候行動嘅解決方案㗎。咁我哋不如將時間交俾 a l e t a l i 啊。好，唔该晒大家。诶、uh, ，好欢迎嚟到我哋呢一个环节啦，可以听到唔同国家地区嘅朋友去分享佢哋嘅气候经验。咁，嗯，因为呢一个 session 咧，大家都系讲英文，咁我哋就而家就会转去用英文。So welcome everyone to our session of youth leaders from different regions sharing on their special personal climate journey. And Now I will start off by sharing my own as the founding member of the Hong Kong Youth for Climate Action (HKYCA). So I'll be sharing my screen now. So this part is called regional sharing on climate, local solutions for global lessons. So I'll be speaking on behalf of youths in Hong Kong as the founding member of the Hong Kong Youth for Climate Action. Later on, we'll also be having representatives from different regions across South Asia. So my name is Natalie Chong. And I'm currently studying an MPhil in Environmental Change and Management at University of Oxford. This is also because I was inspired by a polar explorers when I was in primary five, which is around the age of Lance, who was、uh, who was sharing just now. And then I began to be very interested in climate issue, and hoping to contribute. To play a part in the climate action, then I progress into studying geography in university, and now doing my master's degree, hoping to gain more scientific knowledge on how to solve these climate crises. So we are all aware that climate change poses both local and global impacts. So on the global scale, climate change entails a lot of、uh, issues related to equity, and. Especially for sea level rise and differential temperature changes, leading to heat waves as well as droughts in different、uh, regions. While in Hong Kong, we can see that、uh, in 2018, actually, there was a super strong typhoon Mankut, which、uh, smashes through Hong Kong, leading to some electricity outage, storm surges. So we're starting to see more localized impact of climate change and extreme weather events, which is happening and affecting our daily lives. I guess this has brought our attention to、um, the severity of climate change and also thinking of just transition and adaptation of Hong Kong community to climate change. And some of the challenges that youths are facing, or in general,、uh, people are facing in Hong Kong, is that we、uh, we historically we have a lower awareness on local environment, culture, and history, and development is always prioritized over conservation. As mentioned just now, some of the reclamation projects that the government has proposed, or、uh, the proposed、uh, turning of some of the green belts into housing development projects. And another issue is overconsumption, as highlighted by、uh, Mr. Chong earlier in the opening speech. And there is a wasteful culture and fast fashion. Our landfills are going to be saturated soon. And there are also a lot of high emission leisure activities and entertainment, such as、uh, flying abroad or、uh, buying things or、um, going for movies. And、uh, these are issues that Hong Kong are facing in general. So, as part of the action to combat、uh, these challenges, I have co-founded、uh, the Hong Kong Youth for Climate Action as the first youth network to join together 
our collective effort as a platform to raise youth voice and also to inspire original insights on climate issue that matter most to us. And our mission is to mobilize Hong Kong youth to take active climate action in achieving the Paris Achievement Goals. In, um, as our uh, chapter of HKYCA has only been founded for two months since uh, June 2020. And the most recent event we've organized was organizing uh, Youth Voices for Climate Action. It was an online uh, webinar and launch event. We gathered a community of passionate youth um, uh, speaking on our own initiatives and things that we care about. Some people talked about local agriculture, permaculture, as well as um, uh, issues related to gender and um, other aspects and sustainable finance and etc. So I guess looking into the future, um, post-COVID, um, we are thinking of how to uh, advocate for behavioral change of people in Hong Kong, especially uh, for me, I founded an other environmental social enterprise which advocates for local tourism as means to, um, as an outlet for environmental education and to encourage more people to enjoy staycation. And I guess uh, the pandemic has opened opportunities for local tourism and ecotourism and a new opportunity for us to understand the valuable natural assets around us and the ecology and the valuable ecology, which we might not have um, observed before. So I guess uh, for green recovery, it's important for youth to bridge the gap and to bring more people on board to climate solutions. Yeah, so this is the Instagram, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook handles for Hong Kong Youth for Climate Action. So feel free to follow us. Now, um, I will be introducing our next youth uh, speaker from China. So uh, I want to introduce to you all Fei Liu, Fei Liu, the Deputy Secretary General of China Youth Climate Action Network, CYCAN. So Fei is the current Deputy Secretary General of CYCAN. She's also the co-founder of Salu Studio in the UK. As an international art and design company, Salu Studio advocates its concern for environmental issues through art and technology. And Fate initiated the project of redoing the path of the mankind migration from more than 20 countries in East Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia to shoot documentaries on global climate and its countermeasures. So let us welcome Fate and her introduction. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's such a great honor to be here at the local conference of youth uh, in Hong Kong. So I am Fei. I am the uh, Deputy Secretary General of CYCAN. So CYCAN is in abbreviation of uh, China Youth Climate Action Network. Um, and we are the first non-profit environmental organization in China to focus on empowering Chinese youth to take action and provide voice for uh, university students and young people to um, actually take uh, initiative to tackling climate change. And um, it was, CYCAN was established in 2007, and now we have engaged uh, more than 500 Chinese universities uh, and hundreds of thousands Chinese youth to actually um, raising the awareness on climate change um, and taking actions at the same time. So uh, focusing China uh, on a macro level, um, probably all of you have known that President Xi has committed that China um, will, um, will have have its carbon emission peaking before 2030 and achieve carbon neutral before 2060. And that's on a micro level has really boosted confidence in the, uh, in, uh, for people who work in this field. And what's more um, positive um, from my point of view is that instead of focusing on deadline 2030 and 2060, more and more discussions are now focusing on the before. So how do we achieve the target before the deadline, um, which 
like in general is uh, a really uh, big confident boost in in the in the in the sector. Uh, as for CYCAN and youth in China, in fact, for the first ten years, um, CYCAN what mainly CYCAN was doing is to raising the awareness among young people on the issue. But as everybody knows, that awareness is not enough. Um, we must take action. Um, must be in place. So um, in order to 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 do the transition within the organization, we actually did a nationwide research survey on the current situation of China youth awareness and action regarding climate action. And it's a fairly recent survey. So maybe I'll share with you some of the key findings um, uh, we have in the survey that we see that um, clearly more than 85% of the youth believe that we are having a climate crisis crisis and um, nearly half of them think actually climate change is the most important and severe issue that we are facing at the current moment even compared with inequality poverty and so on um, and at the same time when um, most people uh, don't relate climate change to themselves as as much because when we're asking them uh, what's the first image or what's the first words um, uh, that you think of when when uh, when we talk about climate change, um, most people would still responding like the melting glaciers uh, and uh, raising temperature, but not much about the the current uh, food crisis or to our health or to the to the weather patterns that. Uh, we see that is changing more extreme weathers. Um, so we could see that there's the um, the relevance to oneself is not yet in place as we would like it to be. Um, and on the same time, when we work with uh, the younger generation, their their favorite channel for getting more information and getting more involved is through um, documentary. To um, it's much um, more preferred than the media channels and uh, textbooks. And the, the, the most preferred way of taking action is by joining activities and workshops organized by student unions and NGOs. Um, these are uh, the situation for the Chinese university students. So um, in general, I would say the awareness is there. Um, knowledge needs to be updated. Um, we need to build the relevance um, with like the individual and there is uh, also a lack of action in the in the daily life and then how should we engage them that's the question um, we ask ourselves constantly um, more and more engaging them to take action um, so what what right now we're trying to build the relevance and spreading knowledge in their uh, preferred way. So first we're launching a campaign called the um, make, make, Let's Make the Tradition Be Popular Again, um, using mini documentaries about our traditional lifestyle in our grandparents' generation and make the connection with um, what everybody is talking about these days is a zero waste lifestyle uh, and also a sustainable lifestyle rather than seeing it as uh, you know a western movement we see it in our tradition and find the tradition in our own home and see um, what's the younger generation wants to keep and um, and also stimulate this uh, cross-generation conversations. So that's the first thing we do is to find the connection with the youth in their daily life and learning and pass on our, tr our own traditions in China. And um, number two is that since people like workshops, we are also organizing more um, uh, workshops related to sustainable life. Um, so, we have um, these like small camps, like five days to practice zero waste, plant-based diets, minimalism, and so on. These and put these concepts into the workshops. Um, and the people we are choosing to attend the workshops, um, we would call them actually the center of the communities uh, in universities or in their own compound. Um, and we want to train the trainers in order for them to to be the like their own. Um, 
their own center and then empowering them to spread the message with their own community by organizing similar events. And we also provide support for that. And thirdly, um, especially for young college students, what they care about the most is uh, to find a meaningful and interesting job. Um, so far, not much focus is in the climate and sustainable development area. Um, what we are doing now is by uh, building a platform, an employment platform, gathering organizations, social enterprises, uh, and commercial business who are active in the carbon and clim uh, climate and sustainable development sector um, to um, really engage them, to make them focus on, um, on, on this sector. Yeah. Thank so, you so much Faye, for sharing because we're running a bit short on time. So um, do you mind if we move on to the next speaker? Sure. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. But yeah, yeah, but we'll have more time in the breakout room so you can share further with uh, participants interested. And next, we'll move on to Alison Yunzi Lin from Japan. She's a climate activist uh, of Alcor Japan and Climate Youth Japan, CYJ. So Alison is a climate justice activist working as the international outreach lead for Fridays for Future Japan and Climate Youth Japan. She has experience in researching, lobbying and striking to engage the Japanese public and government in more ambitious climate change countermeasures. So let us now welcome Alison to share her stories. Alison, please. Thank you, Natalie, for the introduction. I'll start sharing my um, screen. Oh, uh, wait. Okay. So um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Alison from Japan, and I will be talking about uh, some regional action going on in Japan. So. Uh, I will be getting started right away by starting talking to starting to talk about the effects of climate change in Japan. So, Japan is highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, as you can see here. Um, the typhoons, floods from heavy rains and extreme heat is something Japan is very vulnerable to. In the past few years, these disasters have become much more frequent and intense. This is footage of Typhoon Hagibis in October 2019, which flooded 74,000 homes, placed 7 million people under evacuation order, and caused 15 million USD in damage. And the temperatures in Japan have consistently been rising, causing very extreme heat and lots of people being hospitalized due to heat-related illnesses. So climate injustice is the idea that these worst impacts of climate change that I've described are suffered by the most underprivileged and vulnerable members of society, even though they contribute the least to carbon emissions. Globally, this also means that low-income countries suffer the most without the ability to properly mitigate and adapt. As a high-income country, um, we believe, I believe that um, Japan has both the ability and responsibility to push for these strong climate policies to counter the worst effects of climate change. After all, when you have um, a bathtub that's overflowing with water, you don't keep mopping up the water, you try to turn off the tap. This is a similar analogy we can use for climate change. As extreme weather patterns intensify, the only real solution we have is to tackle the underlying clause of global warming. However, this is far from the case in Japan. Japan's climate policies have long ignored the damage of climate change and rely heavily on fossil fuels. In fact, coal, oil, and gas is projected for about 56% of the energy mix by 2030. Currently, Japan is still planning on building around 22 coal-burning power plants around the country in the next five years. It has also been criticized. Its overall Japan's climate policies have been criticized as being highly inefficient by many different uh, cl scientists, such as the cl Climate Action Tracker, a think tank. And it predicts that if every country had similar policies as Japan, then global warming would reach perhaps four degrees. In Japan, though, young people have been a small but insistent force to demand political action for climate change. In particular, I want to talk about um, the work of a, one climate organization that I, work, that I work with, which is Fridays for Future Japan. Fridays for Future Japan, or FFF Japan, seeks to mobilize the public and the government to reduce carbon emissions enough to align with the Paris Agreement limit warming to 1.5 degrees. 
I think I like to think of our efforts, which is some geared towards the public and some geared towards the government as rolling a snowball. Hopefully they'll build, build onto each other until we come, um, become an unstoppable force. Most of you probably know about Fridays for Future climate strikes, which is started by Greta Thunberg in Sweden. So it's where students strike school to, to protest in the streets for the climate. In March 2019, FFF Japan had its first global climate march with about 300 people in two cities. By September, however, the next global climate march, we had 5,000 people marching in 27 locations across Japan. On a personal note, that was also my personal first strike. You can see me in the bottom right picture. I was complete, completely awed by the dedication and passion of the people around me, so I started organizing in my own city, which is Kobe. Since then, um, the, this is the locations in the September climate strike. Since then, within Kobe, we've organized our own climate marches. And then as a uh, uh, COVID when as COVID happened, we had online climate strikes, and we tried. We even had to phrase "kiko mo kiki" or "the climate is also in a crisis." Reach number eight trending on Japanese Twitter. Last month, we carried out our own socially distanced climate shoe strikes with about four thousand participants from around Japan. So, I like to see um, these climate strikes as just an indicator of public opinion in Japan. Overall, we tried to mobilize. Um, to try to awaken public consciousness through different campaigns by engaging with more well-known public figures in Japan, carrying out petition campaigns on change.org, launching our own social media, and collaborating with businesses like Keen and Patagonia, who are who have very who are empathetic with our uh, goals to to further awaken public consciousness. So after all, these are all a means to an end, I believe, which is to give the platform, the youth, a platform to voice their opinions on climate, what climate action is necessary. This work has propelled us into direct conversation with the government. These are some other uh, local actions we've done locally in FFF Kobe. But ultimately, the goal is for us to be able to talk directly with the government and issue our demands for what we believe climate action should be like. So this is where we had opinion exchange meetings where we directly asked the government, our city council to declare a climate emergency. And this is Friday to Future Japan. After we launched our petition campaign online, we, seek to, we sought to deliver it directly to the government and for them to adopt it. So one, uh, one indicator of the effects we've had is that, we've, that about a year ago today, only two municipalities in Japan had declared climate emergencies and uh, made stricter carbon emission reduction targets, but about this month, that number has increased to 50 due to lobbying by different Fridays for Future chapters in Japan, as well as different climate organizations. So, um, the expectation is that a vaccine will probably, hopefully, be developed in the next few months. As we return to pre-pandemic levels of industrial activity, I think the concept of a green recovery is more important the, than ever. The decisions that the government make will have long-lasting effects about which the governments make about which industries to invest in will have long-lasting effects on our future. Also, there are so many parallels that can be drawn between our response to the pandemic and the topic of climate justice. How, when it, even though a crisis can affect everyone, it is the most vulnerable members in our society who face the worst effects. So, um, recently, the Japanese government, like uh, Faye mentioned about China, has declared that it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, which is a belated but a very good first step. Fridays for Future Japan will, of course, and all other youth organizations and climate organizations will work to make sure that this isn't just, like Faye said, a faraway goal, but that they're taking concrete steps right now to phase out coal and introduce renewables on a large scale. Thank you so much for oh. sharing, Alison. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, please uh, finish this graphic and okay. then we can move on. <laughs> So lastly, just lastly, I think because we're at Elcoy, the local conference of youth, I wanted to share what I think are the key strengths and drawbacks of advocating for climate justice as a young person. So the good part is at our age, we have the moral authority on this issue. We haven't contributed to the policies that, have, that are polluting our world and the polluting industries and polluting policies. We can unapologetically demand the right to a sustainable, just and livable future. There's a set of challenges that come along with that as well, which is the fact that we'll always, almost always be underestimated. So we have to come prepared to know that our, to know, make sure we know our, what the science behind what we're talking about and to make sure we're always uh, advocating for what, for a just future. So um, thank you. And here are some notations. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much for an inspiring remark, especially at the end. Uh, so now we'll be welcoming Leah from Indonesia. Leah Sakia is a research associate at the Institute of Sustainable Earth and Resources at Universitas Indonesia and climate change communication practitioner. So Leah, the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Leah, uh, now based in Jakarta, work from home. Uh, so happy to be here. And I'm going to share uh, some uh, materials uh, about climate change communication and how uh, the importance of targeting the right audience for uh, campaigning for climate actions. So uh, because my background is a, a researcher, especially for behavioral change communication, uh, and then I have been involved in several um, youth activities across Indonesia um, to kind of educate them and then empower them. It's, uh, that's the most important thing, empower them uh, to know that they have a power to create change, uh, both in their society, uh, their neighborhood, or also nationwide. Um, so I've also worked for the government as well. So I have, um, you know, have some awareness of how difficult it is in the policy level to move things forward. Um, there are, you know, there are political issue and then uh, economic interests involved in that. Um, so while I'm also still have connection with the government, uh, I also very passionate about working with youth. Uh, in Indonesia, especially from different areas in Indonesia. As you see that, you know, uh, uh, Indonesia has the fourth largest population in the world. Um, and then we are in the top 10, always in the top 10 of global emitters right now <laughs> every year. Um, and then we have 17,558 islands. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to pronounce. Um, and so, and we of also different uh, cultures and languages. So we are very diverse in terms of uh, um, communities, uh, cultures, as well as uh, understanding about climate change. So that's what we need to know before we conduct uh, such uh, campaigns to not only raise awareness, but encourage them to take a real action. Um, so, and if you have heard that, you know, Indonesia, uh, uh, experience a lot of mega fires. Uh, our neighbors might, you know, can get witness that as well because um, you experience the impacts like the Singaporeans and the Malaysians. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, disasters related to climate change. Um, and a lot of people are vulnerable, especially in the eastern uh, area of uh, Indonesia, you know, the small islands. Also, because we have a lot of islands, a lot of people live in the coastal areas where, you know, combined with the uh, excessive underground water extractions, it, you know, really creates a lot of uh, disasters on the coastline. So we're very vulnerable on climate change. We uh, emit quite a lot and potentially will be way more because right now the energy sector is not very climate friendly. We are planning to double our coal power plants in Indonesia and then we're planning to clear more land as a way to, you know, a quick recovery from the pandemic. Um, so if we're not very um, uh, concerned about this and then we don't watch this very closely and then demand the government to take more actions on this, um, it would be very difficult. And especially when in Indonesia we have direct elections uh, for the president as well as for the 500 local governments, you know, cities, province, um, it's very important as well to educate the public that the role of government is important. So that's why we need to encourage them not only changing individually, but also trying to uh, move the, uh, uh, to make more uh, political participation uh, stronger. So um, as you see that we need to understand uh, the level of understanding of the people and the perception of people before we are trying to make them uh, do some actions. In Indonesia, uh, the level the, of awareness for cl about climate change is still pretty limited, though now it's much more uh, 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 progressing since a decade ago or a few years ago, uh, but we need way more uh, discussions on this because people's attentions are not on this. This is this is kind of, 
in the bottom list of uh, people's concern. Um, and then also there are a lot of knowledge that needs to be updated as well, uh, as you see in here. So this is some studies that have been conducted by a few organizations. We need way more studies like this, uh, and I'm about to do so for my PhD project. And, and also we are very vulnerable to climate change, but we prepare the least uh, compared to the others. Um, there's this, you know, the base in Asia, mostly uh, way more than in, in Indonesia. So we need to also address this one. And the motivators for action, sometimes um, uh, not only about environment, sometimes we need to frame it or uh, choose another angle that is more relevant to them while slowly trying to build some uh, uh, knowledge on that. And also the confidence in levels of government. So this is this is creating some um, you know some segmentation. So this is way updated. It's 2012, but like no reason studies nationwide conducted on this. So I'm planning to do that next year um, to give us more uh, a good picture of Indonesian uh, audience. So a lot of this, you know, you don't see any denials there most people are kind of accepted what needs to be done but you know they have limited knowledge on that and with if we compare it to america's case you know it's, it's different and then i'm sure in your country is also different so we need to have this kind of uh, studies uh, to make our message uh, uh you know a more receptive uh, receptive by them because climate change is actually a communication emergency. Um, so, um, and one media expert here say that it's possible to make it important, but hard to make it interesting. And people now uh, with all the distractions, they need something that grab their attention. In Indonesia, because we are mostly a society that holds on tradition and then also religion, uh, the role of religious leaders and you know community leaders are important. So that's uh, I think one of the key opinion leaders that we need to hold. Uh, you know, other than the celebrities, the celebrities also started to influence the public in general through making movies that you know played in cinemas, not only documentary movies. So they they started to have some impacts but uh, a good study needs to be conducted to know uh, objectively what the impacts are to people's mind and you know we also need to understand um, the barriers thank to response. <laughs> yes. yes thank you so much Leah but yeah. unfortunately yeah. time is about yeah. if I can get 30 seconds is that okay um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So now <laughs> we have, yeah, we have all these traditions in Indonesia that we need to uh, uh, try to uh, bring it again to people that this is actually climate friendly. Uh, and then this is one of the Youth for Climate Camp Indonesia where we empower them. We empower them to choose their own action, whether they go to the street for Fridays for Future or they cook or they write or they sing or they make TikTok videos. Um, so it's, it's up to them as long as we empower them and we really uh, monitor their progress over time, how many uh, uh, participants they impacted, how many artworks they created, it actually can go uh, hand in hand. And also not to forget that we ask them to also meet the governments as well. We make the governments as the keynote listener instead of keynote speakers and the youth who are the one who is demanding. So that's what we need to do. And then hopefully by like gathering all, um, you know, uh, all here people, activists from other countries as well, I think we can combine forces to make this uh, more widely uh, um, uh, learning from best practices from other countries. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Leah. Get smart, get active. We'll definitely follow your advice. And now we'll move on to representative from Malaysia, Lafania. She's a Malaysian youth delegation, uh, a, the co-focal point of Malaysia youth delegation. Lafania has been involved in climate change policy for the past four years since she got involved with NYD and she attended COP23 in 2007, 2017 and the intercessional in Bangkok in 2018 as youth delegate. So may we now welcome Lafania. Um, Lafania, I think you're muted. 
Whoops, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me and I'm so excited to be here this morning and to be able to share from Malaysia with a Southeast Asian audience. Um, in Malaysia, I found that our a lot of our challenges also, were also resonated a lot with the Indonesian speaker, Leah. Uh, MYD, we are a youth climate change NGO that works specifically on policy making, climate change and policy. And we do this by advocacy through lobbying the government and trying to increase the youth agenda at the policy making level. Because what we've seen, and I'm sure a lot of you all can identify with this as well, is that the political elites tend to be the gatekeepers to political improvement and policy change. And what they want is oftentimes very different from what we want because we're talking about people less than 30 versus people who are in their 50s, 60s and 70s. So, for example, one of our, our ex-Prime Minister, uh, he wanted to implement a third national car. A third national car, not the first, not the second, but the third. And he had also been talking about this. He implemented the first national car back in, well, when I was born, uh, 20 plus years ago. So some their agendas haven't changed, but for youth like us, we want other things, right? We want flexi working hours. We want better public transport, better minimum wage, etc. So policies like that, for us to represent our thoughts at the policy making level is really, really important. And I think as a youth, I felt this in the past and I'm sure many of you have, you feel very frustrated because you can't seem to do anything. You can't seem to make changes. And, and as an individual, how do you, how do you make a difference to something as big as climate change, you know? So if you guys have had that, a similar issue or you've felt something similar maybe you can leave me a thumbs up reaction in your in your little box and people watching the fb live can drop their comments about how they have felt in their journey uh, to address climate change so related to this i also work with verse which means clean in our national language uh, we work towards electoral reform and democracy and ever since working with them, I've realized that climate change issues and democracy or en environmental issues really go hand in hand with democracy and direct representation of the people's voice uh, in policy making. So just to illustrate uh, one example, right now we are under movement control order in the Klang Valley. Uh, so we're talking about a population of about 8 million people who are supposed to stay at home. And over the past month or so, we've been having repeated water cuts because of pollution of different, different rivers at different points of time. And at any one time, we're having people going for seven days without water. People um, and the population that's affected, we're talking about like five million people who don't get water or who get very little water. And this is during a movement control order when you're supposed to stay at home. So instead you have people lining up outside at water trucks to get water. So this was because a factory, various factories have been polluting the river. And when they investigated, they found that these factories have been operating without licenses, uh, built without permission of the local councils. And in some cases, the factory was a repeat offender of polluting the river. So why there is this case is because the local councils are not taking action because they don't feel like they are, they have a responsibility to the people. These local councils are not elected uh, members. They are nominated by the government. So in Bursay, we are trying to uh, implement local elections. We had it a long time ago in the past, but it was stopped. So we're trying to bring that back so that we people can have a direct say in what happens in the environment around them. And this is something that will increase uh, awareness of these issues as well. A lot of people are not aware. According to a poll in last year, 
by our national newspaper, only about 64% of youth are concerned or aware about climate change, which is quite low. And we could definitely increase this number. So that's one way that I see democracy and environmental issues and climate change issues uh, being directly linked. And in MOID, we, as I mentioned, we increased, we try to increase the youth agenda in the policy making process. So we have uh, talked with the government, we uh, have bilateral relations with them, we accompany their negotiators to COP, um, and we have a close rapport with them. And most lately, we have been trying to get ourselves a seat at the discussion tables on the actual policy making, national policy making process. Uh, and we have been trying to increase this presence among uh, the youth as well and the general public. A lot of what we do is advocacy. So, for example, we are also organizing a similar event to this, another Alcoy in Malaysia. It will be the third time that we have that we'll be organizing this in the coming months. Or it'll be running over three weekends. So, if you're interested, you can just check out our Facebook page on that. It's called the Malaysian Youth Delegation. Yeah, thank you so much, Lavanya, for your sharing. Uh -huh. And sorry, it's uh, the time is a bit tight today, and we will definitely look out for the Alcoy in Malaysia. And if you want anyone to, uh, like any Hong Kong representatives to join, feel free to let us know, and then we can have more collaboration on that front. And yeah, now we'll be welcoming from Philippines, Mitzi Jonel Tan, an international spokesperson and youth advocates for Climate Action Philippines. Mitzi is the convener and international spokesperson of the Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines and also active on Fridays for Future International. So may we now have Mitzi share her climate journey. Hi everyone, so I am Mitzi um, from Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines and last night I got the news that Super Typhoon Goni um, which has been called this year's most intense storm on the planet is arriving in the Philippines. Today, I was a few minutes late because I couldn't connect to the internet because of the typhoon happening outside. Today, it was the internet connection that suffered. Tomorrow, we could have no electricity. The next day, trees could fall in our house. The day after, the raging floods could enter our house and we'd have to evacuate. This is the reality of the Philippines, facing stronger and more frequent typhoons every day. But the thing is, I'm still one of the more privileged ones. The ones that are really impacted by our typhoons and our extreme droughts are the urban poor, the workers, and our environmental defenders, the indigenous peoples, the workers, our farmers, our fisher folk. The defenders are our forests, lands, and seas. And to add to all this, we now have a law in the Philippines, which may sound familiar to a lot of the attendees here, and even some of the speakers, because it's happening all over Southeast Asia. Our governments are calling activists terrorists, threatening our lives when we all, all we do is call, call out in action and we call for justice. But we're not letting this stop us. We're not just sad stories and statistics, we have been fighting back. In Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, since climate awareness isn't great here and since climate justice is a new concept to a lot of young people, Majority of what we do is to talk to people, to have real conversations with the students. If we go to them, we go to their schools, we go to where they are, and we talk about the climate crisis and we talk about climate justice. And the most important thing is we also amplify the voices of our environmental defenders. We go to the defenders and we bring students to the defenders so that we can learn from them and we can really amplify their voices and stand united with them because that is a key aspect of the solution. That's what we need for a green recovery. We need to amplify the voices of those in the front lines and stand united with them. Any program for a just and green recovery needs active consultation and participation of the different sectors of society. And this is what we've been trying to do. Although COVID-19 has put a stop to a lot of our efforts because we're not allowed to go outside and go to people. Um, but before the pandemic, and now we're trying to do it online, but it is difficult. Um, we've been consulting people. We've been, we've been asking scientists and experts, but also those who have been fighting for the environment for so long 
we've been asking them what their thoughts of a green recovery are, and we've been compiling all this together, and we've been talking to policymakers, and that's what is so important for a green and just recovery, making sure that all sectors of society, especially the youth, are represented and are actively participating and to be able to actively participate they need climate education and a lot of people in the philippines well first education isn't exactly easy to um have here like not everyone has access to quality education and for a lot of the youth who do have education our, our climate science how climate change is taught to us is very westernized and alienating and foreign full of technical terms that alienate the Filipino youth. And this is something that I've, with my conversation with people across Asia, it, it seems to be something that's happening everywhere. And that's what we really need to make sure to do. We have to make sure that we own our struggle. Us as Asians, us as wherever country we're from, we own our climate justice struggle. We own our climate justice movement. And it's not a Western movement that we copy paste here. But it's also important to make sure that we collaborate with everyone across the world because really we are solving a global and systemic problem. So we need a global and systemic solution of the entire world, of the entire youth connecting with one another and really resisting as one planet because this is such a huge problem that we're dealing with. It can be so overwhelming, but history has told us that people's movements, they work. They always win. It takes long. And that's the hard part with the climate crisis because we have a deadline, but it's not impossible. And really, if anyone can do the impossible, it's us, it's the youth. And we're always going to be able to do it as long as we work with the masses, we work with the environmental defenders and the people in the front lines. Great. Thank you so much for your sharing. It's very inspiring and we hope to see more collaboration and best wishes to the typhoon. Hope it will not uh, create too much uh, damages and uh, sufferings. And now we'll move on to our Singaporean representative, Nola Strina Hamid, the co-founder of Singapore Youth for Climate Action. So Nastrina is the co-founder of SYCA, and she's primarily interested in climate issues and how people respond to climate impacts. Let us welcome Nastrina now with her very cool background. Thank you, Natalie, and hi everyone over Zoom and also on Facebook. So I'm Lastrina, co-founder of Singapore Youth for Climate Action, and I'm excited to be here sharing uh, with you some of my perspectives on climate change. So we've heard from speakers from Hong Kong, from China, Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines. And for me right now, I'll be focusing on Singapore. So let me just share with you my screen. All right, so if you can see my screen, do give me a thumbs up. Okay. All right, so for today's sharing, um, so I'll keep note that it's five minutes um, during the panel session and I'll really focus on local solutions that's happening in Singapore right here. And I'll keep the presentation specific to these three points. Right, so a specific challenge rising in my community. Um, how do young people respond to this challenge? And what are some of the lessons that we hope um, everyone here, all the youths here, uh, can learn in order to achieve a green recovery? So first up, on a specific challenge um, arising from climate change uh, in my community, um, I think as what many of the earlier speakers has mentioned, you know, lots of people are already aware of climate change, um, but we're just not doing enough or maybe not having ambitious plans or actions to tackle climate change. So similarly, this is also the case um, that's happening in Singapore. So if I may just share with you uh, some numbers, you know, some survey findings. Um, we have had surveys in Singapore since 2011, um, trying to understand people's perception on climate change. So this is one of the latest one uh, run by a company called MediaCore in Singapore. Um, and so around 1,000 people aged 18 and above 
uh, they did this survey that was self-administered. And the survey was really to understand people's perception of climate change and uh, the government's actions towards it. So findings um, says that more than nine in 10 Singaporeans are concerned about climate change. And if I may share with you some of the numbers, um, I hope it's clear on your screen. Um, so these are some of the numbers. If I may just focus on the three bar charts in the middle. All right. So it's good. It's good to see uh, a huge portion saying that, you know, I am concerned about the impact of climate change. I will do my part. Um, I am aware of what the government is doing. So the numbers are good. Um, people are aware. Um, similarly, uh, another perception survey findings was also published um, later on in 2019. So the other one was in August, this one was in December, um, and there was also similar findings. So this time around, it's also about 1,000 Singapore residents, um, but the format of the research method was a bit different. Um, this time around, it was aged 15 and above, and it was face-to-face -face interviews. But, you know, again, the findings say similar um, issues or similar highlights. So these four points were highlighted. There is higher public awareness. Um, there's strong support to shift to low carbon economy. More individuals are taking climate actions and that collective action is needed. Um, but again, remember, awareness and action is not the same thing, right? So when people say that they are ready to take climate friendly actions, what kind of climate actions are we talking about? So from the survey, all right. So as you can see, the kind of actions that's being highlighted, it's really simple actions that individual can do. There's obviously, you know, there's nothing wrong with these, right? This is considered a climate action as well, right? But I think when we're talking about impacts and reducing tons of carbon emission, do you think switching off electrical appliance, conserving water, reducing food wastage at the individual level, what kind of impact can that make or can that result in? So perhaps when we look at things from that perspective, um, more needs to be done, right? So then how are young people in my community responding to it, responding to this challenge of how do we move from awareness to encouraging people to take more ambitious actions Okay, so I'm just going to highlight three um, initiatives or three um, things that's happening in Singapore. I'm just going very broad on this as well. Okay, so one um, idea or one activity that's happening in Singapore right now is that we have a community uh, called Singapore Youth for Climate Action. This is the group that I co-founded in 2015. I know some of the earlier speakers also shared that they co-founded some organizations. Um, I believe many of those organizations are legally registered. Um, for SYCA, we are not. So we're a community of people which are volunteer-led, uh, volunteer-run. And what we do is we focus on activities that build climate awareness and empower people. So we do things like organizing learning workshops or giving climate talks. And uh, when there's opportunities, we also send people to the UN Climate Change Conference. So this is just, you know, one uh, initiative that's happening in Singapore. Another one that's happening. So we also have another group called SG Climate Rally. So if you search for this group name um, in Google, um, you'll see that in 2019, they were the ones who organized Singapore's first climate rally um, and it was at a park and more than 2,000 people turned up for it. It was great and it showed a very, it was a very visual pre um, presentation of the number of people who really wanted to push for more climate ambition and I just wanted to highlight this current campaign that they have um, which I find I would say interesting in the sense that it leverages on social media and also encourages people to reimagine our future. Something that youths in other countries can perhaps consider doing as well. The third and last uh, example that I wanted to share is this Instagram um, account run by this young person called Chu Yun. So she uses the URL or the Instagram account named The Weird and Wild. 
So what Trian does is she takes big topics like big climate change, sustainability topics, and she breaks them down into smaller bite-sized informations and she translates them into visually interesting infographics. So I encourage you to check out her Instagram, do give her a follow, um, and you know perhaps see how you can also do this in your country or in your community context. And so this brings me to my last section of my sharing for the panel. Um, what is the lesson for other youths to learn from this, right, in order to achieve green recovery? So I know you've heard from many speakers already, and we also still have two more speakers later. Um, so I just thought of just summarizing um, what I'm hearing from everyone, and also I feel something that is reflected in the Singapore's context. So it's ABC. Um, there is a need for us to build awareness, and build awareness is not just, you know, building awareness from the government perspective, but also it has to be ground up. Um, we talk about building the movement. So building the movement in this case, um, so I am someone who truly believes in the power of volunteerism um, and also um, just, you know, self-organizing. And I believe this has to happen from the ground up and that's where we can create system systemic change progressively um, and see uh, collective action. So the kind of collective action I'm talking about, you know, it's not just oh, you know, all the green groups come together and let's push for a more uh, ambitious policy. And it's not just about, you know, government and set board agencies coming together to push for more top-down approach. The kind of collective action I'm talking about is really, you know, to have that community collaborative approach where various stakeholders from different parts of the community um, come together to take action. And I hope um, having this ABC step as a summary page of thoughts um, would be helpful for you to also reflect upon in your community context. So that's it from my um, end. Um, if you're interested to hear more, um, especially what Singapore has been doing this year, um, feel free to ask me later in the breakout session. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your sharing. And now we move on to our representative from South Korea. Chi Hee Lee, Project Manager of Green Environment Youth Korea, GEYK. Chi Hee is the Project Manager of Research Study in GEYK, and she's majoring in Environmental Science and Ecological Engineering at Korea University. So maybe we now welcome Chi Hee for her sharing. Hi everyone, I'm Jie Lee, one of the members of GYK in South Korea. It's a great honor to introduce our Youth Climate Actions as a representative of Korea in Elkowi, Hong Kong. This is the contents of my presentation. Um, yeah, I will talk about the Korean climate crisis issues by producing, introducing our activities. GYK is a youth platform in South Korea to share knowledge and experience, take actions locally and internationally, and learn, project, and inspire people to take care about the climate change. We have been started since 2014. Now, over 50 members are participating and managing in our project actively. This shows our activities in this year briefly. First, we attend seminar and studies for training and capacity building. Especially, I am the project manager of the research and study team where members pick the topic they want to study more and do it by themselves. Also, we are going to hold Elkoi Korea on November 7. Next, we work on raising awareness of the public with domestic or organizations. For, ex for example, our members are working on programs to propose environmental policies with the Seoul Metropolitan Government, such as increasing subsidies for electric vehicles or adding the decla declaration that they will consider divestment issue when choosing the primary bank to the city plan. In addition, we build a network with foreign organizations. Our organization has taken part in UNFCCCOP as the Korean news delegate. Finally, we make various activities for mingling considering the trend and interest of the public. Some people think the 
climate crisis issues are quite difficult problem to solve or handle, so we try to combine the familiar stuff in our life, such as movies, fashion, foods, and so on. Therefore, we host some climate change movie shows and cooking shows to produce vegetarian, uh, how to make vegetarian food like tofu steak. Recently, the new sector service has been launched and we have been trying to provide mainly the climate change issues in the foreign press that the Korean press is not interested in. In the previous page, I focus on talking about the activities we are doing this year, and these are the past programs we conducted. Power Shift Korea is a kind of seminar about the energy transition, especially about the divestment. The second 1B project is an educational volunteer program to inform the importance of bees and ecology. The last one, Pe People Climate March did didn't go well due to COVID-19 this year, but we always do March with high school students and other organizations every year. I mentioned before, we are cons concentrating on the divestment, which means the reduction of some kind of asset for financial ethical or political objects or sale of existing business by firm. This is the main issue we try to change and it's, re it's highly related to the green recovery because unfortunately, Korea is selected as one of the countries that invest the most in core around the world. Especially core power plants introduce a lot of greenhouse gases and make air pollution worse. Thus, we want to change our traditional energy structure to sustainable natural energy sources. Also, this is one of our, our main activities. We hold the side events at Korea Pavilion and take pay attention to making more voice of Korean news to the international community. These are the pictures that we've done before. This is the end of my speech and thank you for your invitation as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the breaking, se breaking up session and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Shihi, for your sharing. And now we'll move on to our final speaker from Taiwan, Ms. Han Wei Chang, Chair of Board, Taiwan Youth. Uh, Taiwan Youth Climate Coalition. Hanwei is the chair of the board at Taiwan Youth uh, Climate Coalition, which is the first youth environmental NGO, believing it is crucial to involve not only public awareness, but also youth empowerment about any kind of climate issues in Taiwan. So may we now welcome Hanwei. Hello. Thank you for introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay. So I think uh, I'm Han Wei, and uh, I'm the chair of Taiwan Youth Climate Coalition, which in short is TWYCC TWIC. And TWIC is, uh, sorry, TWIC is a non-profit organization, and we uh, tackle with climate change through involvement in international cooperation. And uh, we believe in use power and take actions of climate empowerment. So let me give you a short introduction of uh, what Taiwan is facing. Uh, Taiwan is also uh, very vulnerable to the climate emergency and the risk we are facing is extremely heavy rain and extremely hot weather, uh, especially with uh, our, this actually this year, uh, this summer is the hottest summer in Taiwan. And after the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, it is very lucky for Taiwan that Taiwan has been able to contain the pandemic and minimize its impact on people's daily lives because of the transparency and honesty with which Taiwan has implemented good prevention measures. However, the postponement of COP26 uh, is not a good news for TWIC 
and uh, activists uh, and climate activists in Taiwan because it is difficult for us to uh, like sharing our experience in person. So uh, we're figuring out uh, how to keep connecting to use climate networks. So our strategy is Asian use uh, to man keep maintaining the connection of uh, Asian use climate network. So uh, we launched a cooperation task, task force with Climate Use Japan. We are now working on a, a plastic pollution project. And we also invited Malaysian use uh, a, a member, uh, uh, sorry, Malaysian use dedicates dedications member who study in Taiwan to our monthly meeting to share her experience of uh, engaged public and used in Parliament. And because of the postpone of uh, COP26, uh, usually we are pre uh, need a lot of time to prepare for the sharing and the uh, like workshops for COI and COP. But now we don't have to do that. So we are now uh, starting our uh, official English blog on Medium. And if you, so now uh, Tweek can share our actions in English on Medium for the overall, uh, uh, overall uh, audience or activists uh, globally. And this year in uh, September, we also have our uh, March for the Climate to cooperate with stakeholders of climate change to uh, carry six demands and a proposition of 165 actions to the attention of the government. So unfortunately, uh, our, our government didn't announce, didn't announce any policy change for green uh, recovery. So we aim, uh, so we uh, ask gov our government to aim for net zero carbon emission by uh, 2050. And we also want our government to declare climate change as a national crisis and move its governments to the presidential office and the Green Deal should be put on the table to show the way into becoming a sustainable uh, economy. And of course, it's very important to cooperate with our government to raise awareness and educate people on climate change. And um, so the last but not least, more research funding and a policy driven by science is very important for Taiwan now because if we don't know the possible risk for Taiwan and we cannot have good plan to do the green recovery. And uh, we also, we will have our annual event, uh, annual youth empowerment workshop in January. We hope more and more Taiwanese youth realize the six demands we uh, provide in the uh, in the march is very important and they take their own actions. So thank you, this is my sharing. And if you want to know more, please follow Tweek on Medium. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Henry, for sharing and we'll be following Tweek's latest updates. Now we move on to a short uh, Q&A session. If anyone has questions, feel free to type it in the chat box or raise your hand so that we can point to you and you can unmute to ask your question. I... Uh, I see, I see one hands up. 
Arushi, do you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for your amazing sharing. I just have a, a question. I mean, anyone can answer. What is one immediate step that the youth, like someone like me, I'm in Hong Kong, I'm not part of any organization. What is one immediate step that I can take to feel more empowered? And I know it's not instant, the, the result, but one immediate step and one long-term step that I can take to raise awareness or to take action. Maybe you can share where you started. Thank you. Yeah, any speaker, feel free to go ahead. I would say that the immediate step to take to feel empowered is to definitely join the Hong Kong climate team. <laughs> That'll be the best way to join them and to they'll be able to help you and provide you with whatever resources you would need to do to make a difference. And at the very, very least, you'd probably just learn a lot more about what to do as an individual. Yeah. So anyone else want to take what's the long term step? Yeah, maybe if I may uh, um, add, uh, just like in my last slide, it's get smart, get loud and get active. Um, so how, um, like whether or not, like you've been in this climate area for a long time, you still have a lot of things to learn every day. Uh, so it's very important, uh, to like understand more about the subject, like following all the Instagram accounts or Twitter accounts of climate scientists, climate activists. I think that's the first step you can do right now. <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh, by that, and then we need to get loud more, um, so that, you know, the government's heard our actions because a lot of, uh, 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 policymakers, they say, well, my constituents didn't want more climate actions. It's maybe because we don't really voice it enough. So if like we can get enough people to voice it, it can put pressure uh, to the government, especially the case in Indonesia where the uh, leaders are elected by the people and then get active, just like make movement, like what Lastrina said, just, just start it right now, uh, um, 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 the movement. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we have one more question from the chat box. Oh, did uh, Jihee, do you want to say something? Or... Um, yeah, so we have one more question in the chat box saying that I uh, want to ask what is the Bali tradition that helps reduce the carbon that Leah mentioned? Leah, I want to elaborate a bit. Yeah, it's called Nyepi. Uh, so uh, when people are celebrating Yepi for one day, the whole Balinese uh, don't use electricity, they stay at home, they don't use fire, they don't go anywhere, they don't use transport. So it's uh, a day full of, like an earth hour, but it's a whole day. <laughs> and they also meditate, you know, they, they don't eat uh, uh, something that is harmful to their bodies. So if we can have that, uh, a day throughout Indonesia, you know, 260 million people do that. I think that would be awesome as well. And, and you know, this kind of tradition, uh, local tradition, local wisdom that we need to, uh, um, you know, put up more uh, in scale and maybe institutional, institutionalize it so that, you know, people have more empowerment, have more understanding and be mindful of what they consume uh, uh, and about, about uh, their contribution to the earth. So yeah, Nyepi, if, if you come to Bali during Nyepi, uh, it's awesome. You can see the stars uh, at night, super bright because no one turn off, turn on the light. So yeah, it's great. So it's like an environmental, spiritual and physical cleanse day. Yes, yes. So cool. Okay, I'm going to go and check out, read up on this after this. Yeah, yeah. It's called Nyepi. 